My name is Joseph Wonderich. I'm a professor of engineering architecture and computer science. This is a course lecture on uh, architecture studio one, architecture materials and methods. Screen. So we're in uh, my website here. So in our architecture courses, uh, and we'll go to syllabi for that. And we are in Studio One. Uh, this is a course that was already taught previously in different forms, including a three credit version, which was materials and methods courses. We are used to rotate by rotating the lecture series. A number of different, we've got like seven different ones in the studio. So we're going to start with uh, this one here, which is uh, structural design concepts. This is the PDF that I'm going to narrate, uh, upload as an MP4, and they uh, probably put it on YouTube. Which here. This screen. Okay, so this is conceptual structural design of the engineers in here. This is redundant to things that they learn already, but it's an important uh, basis for materials and methods. Uh, architects. Okay, so architects um, complete studies. I don't read all this here, but design, theory, drawing, art history, urban design, to methods, lighting, acoustic geology, environmental things, um, uh, standards, communications, comm classes, as well, graphic design, but it's not here. And common electives, real estate, uh, I write things. Right. Right. HVAC design, power, technical power, water, and waste infrastructure, but not like the engineers do. Engineers have a significant sequence of courses. Uh, the architects need knowledge of many things uh, uh, to coordinate all of them and structural concepts. Uh, engineers need, of course, you know, physics, calculus, uh, statics, dynamics, materials, materials, science, determinant and determinant structure analysis, separate courses, and uh, reinforcement concrete, lots of materials. So forces, <clears throat> basic forces, compression, tension, shear, torsion, and bending. All of these apply to buildings to different degrees in different uh, parts of the country. Earthquakes are considered lateral loads, SNP wave, both lateral loads. Uh, uh, I guess the is, uh, well, they're both considered lateral loads. The way you model them is a lateral load and brace for lateral loads. Uh, wind, certainly. Uh, tornadoes and hurricanes are, are lateral loads as well as uplift and the loop on. And you have live and dead loads. Uh, the Richter scale um, is uh, is a, a logarithmic scale. So uh, you know, an eight is much stronger than a seven, and seven much stronger than a six. That's uh, that. Um, and then uh, what it feels like compared to tons of dynamite. If you're here to do that comparison. Uh, seismic is P waves and S waves. The P wave is first. If you've ever felt an earthquake, it feels like a thrust on the building and then uh, vibrating after that. Um, uh, they compress and expand the ground as they travel. I'll just shake their um, And there's surface waves. What is shear? So um, this is required on the corners of buildings in most building codes, uh, and uniform building codes, well, it's what used to be in different building codes that I used anyway in the United States. There's like four at one time, but now the uniform building code in the United States is what everybody uses. And, and you've designed for shear, and the corners definitely have a lot to do with that. In, in earthquake zones, you also put shear walls in the middle of the buildings because you're trying to brace for what can happen. Uh, there's also, uh, I guess we'll talk about it here too, moment connection versus lateral braces for steel. But it, you know, shear, you're dealing with uh, lateral uh, forces. And so here is the brace frame with a steel structure. And so uh, 
you have these diagonals, right? In a moment connection, you're relying on the connection itself to be stiff enough to keep the whole thing from racking. This is more expensive. Uh, when I work for developers, we price this at so many dollars to what we could build speculative shell buildings and then uh, fill out any independent improvements for computer companies and things like that. And so there was always a question to, in the beginning, do we do brace frame? Well, in California, I'm not Texas, but in California, brace frame versus moment connection. Brace frame, you block the views, but it's cheaper. I mean, you, you, and, you know, it messes up the floor plan. Some uh, moment connections are better for unobstructed views and not messing with the space, but it's costly, more costly. At the time, it was about $3 a square foot more. Which in today's dollars would be ten dollars a square foot, which is what we're selling over forty years ago. Back in the nineteen eighties, so brace frame versus moment connection, and you can imagine here. And and these need to be done very carefully by professionals trained. This isn't something you can just do; anybody can do. And then they get inspected very carefully. Sometimes X-ray, but you can really mess up these if you have done right. A brace frame versus moment connection. Moment is a torque. And then different kinds of loads. You have point loads. Uh, and there's different ways of showing the ends. It's fixed, fixed or not. So, you know, it's or pinned here. It's on a roller. Uh, the way you move and not makes it make some how to do your calculations. So, you have a point load, uniform distributed load, a triangle load, a trapezoidal load. A point moment, so you can actually have a torque coming in from somewhere else, not uh, just the load creating a torque at the joints, but this could be from another uh, set of units coming across or some machinery or something. A beam with a point load, um, you have free body diagrams, the engineers do this. Now, I'm not going to test on this. This is architecture studio class, it's just an overview of things. But you have uh, you point point loads, and you do a free body diagram. You, you resolve your forces. You have reacting forces. And then you have the, the internals of what's going on. So, uh, to, in, in in a very quick uh, abbreviation of how structures work, you go through your your Newtonian mechanic, Newtonian uh, mechanics and physics one, and then you do a statics class. Some of the forces equal zero on somebody without looking at the stress or strain within the material. You do dynamics, some of the forces don't equal zero, something's moving. And then you do material science called strength of materials and you replace with that strength around here. It's such a material science, Poisson's ratio, stress versus strain, what's going on inside the material and how it reacts. And so you want to start looking at shear forces and, uh, and, and the external moments of I think, apply and how things are working inside, inside the uh, reactor within the material. Um, <clears throat> And so the actual forces shown here with point load, uh, shear forces again, and somehow you show the moments, the torques, how they change positive or negative depending on your beams. You can imagine this whole thing contorting, the beam contorting based on positive moments and negative moments. And deflection is a whole other thing. These are actually the forces. So this is now a free body diagram with our distributed load, a shear, and it has a reaction, and it sets a reaction. And then deflection. So I mentioned this in other courses and students. So I've done a little bit of structural engineering, actually, you know, I worked at developers. I wasn't doing any calculations then, but I did work a year in an engineering firm in San Francisco, which we did use roughly calculations. And it's just algebra. If you get algebra, but if you get something wrong, you know, people can be serious and get killed. So everything matters. And what we found was often that people perceive failure before it's really going to happen. So you design for failure loads, of course, you don't want anything to fail and it's about your safety and building the building. But the deflection themselves, and I've engineered this in my own little projects too, in residential projects, you want to not have people perceive failure imminent. Uh, and so you oversize a little bit to minimize deflection. And then you're, you know, Significantly, but you're more you're oversizing the strength of the beam uh, because you're designing for deflection. But uh, my opinion, and I've had a lot of agreement with other people, especially in earthquake areas, is that uh, you don't want the people to perceive the buildings about the fail. 
So you worry about the collections first. Uh, it's a matter of opinion because really you're really trying to keep the building from falling down, of course. And then beams, the point loader uh, and ends that are free to rotate. And so there, uh, this is getting into a lot of the engineering uh, that we're not going to get into the details here, but if you go to a cross section of a typical material, um, uh, there's a, a moment of inertia uh, that defines how that cross section is going to behave. Uh, and then we've already mentioned moments point of mode reaction, force shield, force of reflection. And then you have this modulus of elasticity, which depends on the beam's material, so how it's going to react. And that depends on what it's moving. That's all part of structural engineering. Structural engineers will uh, do this in exhaustive detail right? because they need to be extremely precise. And it's one little math error, not even algebra error, you know, arithmetic error, people could be hurt. Uh, and then this point so the last one was when we were in to the free to rotate, so it's put you know, free to rotate and then the fixed, and you know how those calculations look again. I'm not going to quiz you on this thing, and then uniform load with ends that are fixed. And then uh, now Revit, Revit, which we do use in here, very expensive, free to us. Because we're educational people, uh, two thousand six hundred dollars per license. If you're going to do it as not a student, that's the minimum. You can pay about six six thousand dollars now, depending on what you get. But so this it does full structural analysis. If you like, that's not what we're doing in studio class. But here's just an uh, example. Uh, I won't play the video here, but well, maybe I can see. Uh, well, I be careful. I'm videotaping this, and that's probably the right thing. So maybe, maybe we'll come back to this after I'm done recording. I don't. You don't want to mess a YouTube video inside of a YouTube video. That's a uh, Building codes is enforced by governing governing jurisdictions oversight. Uh, uh, the uh, international building code. Uh, is up, and that's what everybody uses now. Is updated updated every three years. Minimum design for roads for snow and seismic reading uh, to certain standards, ASC standards. Building codes sets minimum enforcement to, to be enforced. Um, it can be just tables, size and beam. Structural engineers needed for complex structures. So an architect can even use the graphic standards, which is not just graphical standards. They're looked at and it's a lot of detail. You can put pill, pick beam sizes right out of that. Architects can do that on low rises and then on earthquake areas, not low rises, but a residential. Uh, if you go up three stories anywhere, I would probably go structural engineer, certainly seismic standards. But you need a structural engineer for any kind of complexity. You try to build a high rise without an engineer, you're in trouble. And you can't do it in the United States. Some places will. Uh, you use material codes. Uh, and so each of the, uh, the concrete uh, organization, the steel organization, they have their own manuals and then the building codes refer to those manuals. And so um, the engineers certainly know what I'm talking about. And wood also. Um, so design being used in tables. Uh, so you get the building code requirements uh, and you want to find the live loads. Live loads is not just living things, but anything that moves around. Uh, the dead loads is the building itself. Uh, but, you know, wind, snow, people, furniture, all live loads, allowable deflections, um, the length over 360 is, uh, and so floors and plaster ceilings, right? The plaster ceilings are cracked, floors you perceive uh, one deflection. And I can do a little more than that, actually. And then uh, design beam using tables, and then you pick up all these tables. Um, so this one is for wood. And so the deflection and size and choice to go for that to minimize less of that, uh, minimize less. This is the extreme fiber bending design mode. And then you have them for aluminum, concrete, masonry, steel, welding, and wood. So I have a separate course of steel, separate course of concrete, separate solutions, course of wood, and we use each of these things. I didn't take the masonry course, aluminum, I don't think there's an actual course just for it. Uh, welding I saw in robotics world, but not in, uh, but I, you know, there is a design standard for that. And if you're doing a steel design for a living, you probably want to know the welding. 
Uh, factor of safety. So this is when you uh, you design to the building codes or to the uh, you know, to the codes, uh, the material codes, uh, which then the building codes reflect. And there's a factor of safety built on the statistical reliability of the data that went into formulating the codes. So what I mean by that is steel is more pure and made under controlled circumstances, controlled manufacturing. And so it has a lower factor of safety than wood, which can have knots and checks and cleaning, uh, and also can put together sometimes less reliably. And then reinforced concrete is not great either because you can have air bubbles. If the composite material of steel can be in the wrong place. Um, it can be have a too high of a water content, or not the right aggregate size, not be vibrated properly, have wrong admixtures. There's a bunch of stuff that can go wrong with the concrete. So um, you need a maturing process. So there's factors of safety built into the calculations to compensate for that. So you don't have to over design based on your experience knowing that some of these materials are less reliable. It's built into the code that way. Oh, uh, uh, oh, and then now this course we have entire lectures. Actually, have three of or five of them just on wood, five of them on masonry. I think and three on wood, a couple of reinforced concrete, and one steel. Uh, and, and it's not; it's just uh, materials and methods. This is not engineering design course, but we cover those things. Um, and then start comparing materials here. I can just get to. Uh, let's just see real quick here. How many these materials? Steel, concrete, steel. Uh, yeah, no, I can't. No, you can go there. I'll get back to you. All right. Oops. I'm going to get back to the show. It's very nice here. That here, right here. So a couple of case studies. These are my uh, well, so much of my students have seen my projects often. So this is wood um, stick frame, uh, not heavy timber, but light construction, modern construction, and the model I made of it, and. Uh, the wood um, that I used. And I'm still playing on top of the masonry anchor bolted down so the building doesn't fly away and hurricane and tornado. Uh, a main beam carrying the load of the first floor. Oh, so yeah, I didn't go into detail. And steel, this is another project. This is a 13 building office park idea project manager. And I didn't buy the steel for this project. I got on the project with steel was already contracted, but I had 60, 60 different subcontractors because we acted as a room general contractor. So I had to coordinate the steel records and you know, the other trade measure heading. And then on this one here, um, I didn't I, I had seven projects and different general contractor on each, but I did buy materials here. So I bought over a million dollars worth of steel from Japan. I bought about a million dollars of this blue reflective reflective blue glass from Detroit. And I picked these things too, these colors and uh, I sat with the architect and made this this building actually was nominated for a big award. I was part of the design team. We made a full blown everyday architects on this, but I definitely picked a lot of stuff. The trees, the shapes, the colors, the overall layout of things. Um, and so what else? So that that's so here's something else. This happened in 1989, right after I left uh, California. So I worked for developers, went back to school in urban design, worked for San Diego Planning Commission, uh, started getting into high tech. I was a physics grad in San Francisco and teaching astronomy. And then in summers, I was uh, teaching, uh, I was building you know, the brakes, building the oven, building the tank. Actually, before that, before after urban design in San Diego, and before high tech, I worked a year in consulting firm in San Francisco, including structural specification. So this is down in the uh, in the part of San Francisco where they filled in after the 1906 earthquake uh, with debris in the Marina District. They also did it in the China Basin. And so that was loose sediment, loose fill, and it was uh, subject to liquefaction when the SP waves come. 
And so when the earthquake came, right after we moved away from here, a 6.9 earthquake came, and uh, the epicenter was in Santa Cruz, 90 miles away. The waves traveled up through rock, up the peninsula, up through Palo Alto, you know, past Stanford and everything up the peninsula, hit San Francisco. Uh, we lived on a rock. I actually had the US Geological Survey. I went and got the uh, subsurface condition to post them on the kitchen wall with an escape plan for my, me and my wife. She thought it was kind of funny until that happened. And then uh, uh, buildings fell down really near us down the marina. Uh, and also my wife, where she worked in the uh, China Basin, the brick facades fell off. Uh, luckily, she, I mean, we had just moved away. And then the Bay Bridge part of it collapsed and I used to commute with it. Uh, so this is this is what happens. Uh, it's a, a, a Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, 60 something people were killed in this, not this, but this is what happens. That's a stick frame. Uh, critical failure in this design was that the first floor being made of parking garages had less shear wall resistance to lateral seismic load. So the whole nothing happened in the first part was all you know built tightly together with a million little walls. But when you have these empty parking garage uh, without lateral supports, this kind of thing happened. This also happened down in uh, Southern California uh, a decade later, parking garages. Uh, masonry, this is what can happen in mace. This is not uh or this this actually happened this is exactly what my wife was but criti the critical failure in this design was unreinforced masonry uh, uh just should simply not be used in earthquake prone areas uh masonry by itself is great for compression strength it can hold up a little bit you know wind loads laterally but earthquake load will vibrate it apart the mortar will break and things will fall on people's heads and that's how people get hurt uh, structural failure analysis here. Again, this is all conceptual. This is architecture class. So an engineer is going to the detail. But uh, you know, we can see the different kinds of bonds between bricks and uh, the different kinds of failures you can have in the bond and in the brick itself uh, based on bond, bond shear, tension, and compression failures. Uh, this is where I used to commute. Uh, well, actually, back here, the, the, I'd come down this Nimitz freeway, and I, some of my projects, because we're going to engineering firm uh, that we'd meet in San Francisco, and I lived in San Francisco, but the main office was in Lafayette, so I'd drive across the Bay Bridge uh, through Oakland, through the Caldecott Tunnel, into the Central Valley in Lafayette, which was the main office was. But I occasionally have uh, meetings in Oakland for Bay Area Rapid Transit Visit. Underground subway system that goes under the bay and everything. There were specifications, structure specifications in that. And this, uh, luckily, I, I wasn't here. I, we had moved away, but this, there's like practically 60 people killed here when the uh, top deck fell on the bottom deck. And here you can see what happened reinforced concrete. Uh, you have steel for tensile strength, concrete for compression strength. But when you apply a dynamic load, not just a static load with a, a stress wedge lateral load that's proportional, directly proportional to the height of the structure, which is how it was done before this earthquake, and how I learned in school to apply earthquake loads for the seismic load. After this, they went to full dynamic modeling because what happens when it vibrates back and forth, the concrete pops off, and then you're left with just spaghetti here holding up a deck, and that's what killed all the people. So not a good thing. Um, so reinforced concrete here. There's some notes about that. And that uh, uh, liquefaction is over here. The Bay Bridge I go across. The Nimitz Freeway is failed. So this was all south mud. This wasn't because it was filled in from earthquake, 1906 earthquake, like in San Francisco over here. This is just natural geological uh, sediment that they built on it. And that isn't a good foundation. You get liquefaction when the waves get. Yes. So critical fact design was that this connection being reinforced concrete was subject to some very seismic oscillating modes resulting in concrete crumbling away, leaving only a bundle of rebar reinforcing steel to hold up the enormous weight of the upper deck. That was a big design failure right there. And it was to the codes of the time. It wasn't like somebody failed to look at the codes. It's just that this type of shape required a dynamic model. So the codes failed. This is another failure here. The two, the way this deck was put together, I'm just showing the video. So you have C, C channel section. So you cross section of a, a, a structural member, you have C channels, and you have an 
that were butting up against each other and riveted together. But the different ends of the bridge were, you know, pulling apart during that earthquake lateral loads. And so those rivets just sheared and the deck fell. I think two people might have died in you know, a one bridge. Well, I used to be right on this bridge commuting sometimes, or, or I'd be underwater on the bar system coming on the public transit and did that too. So this is what that looked like, pretty scary at the time. Um, so you don't know, mess with those folks. And engineers are critical, uh, life or death. You have to get licensed to be an engineer for public safety. Uh, critical failure in design was these type of connections were simply Riveted together, huge heavy sections of roadway, oscillating seismic lateral loads. That might be some tensile forces due to overall land movement sheet of this. Uh, this is the subsurface conditions, soft sandy soil, subject to liquefaction and subjected to seismic forces. Whole hillsides can collapse, uh, especially in Southern California, the ocean is a problem. One family house had to get rid of their pool because it started sliding down a hill. Uh, so liquefaction is a serious thing. Under non seismic conditions, going to the sub due to the subsurface conditions in California, but when earthquake hits, depending on where you are. So, we were we lived up on the rock up here, and that was fine. But down in the marina here, this was filled from long ago, you know, soft soil, bay mud, they're essentially back or filled in from the construction or the destruction of the 1906 over. And my wife worked down here in China Basin, the brick facades fell off there. Uh, and then the Bay Bridge is over here, and, uh, and then it's freeways on the other side of the Bay. Oh, here I would say here, I put on, had a map on the kitchen wall of the earthquake plant. Uh, I really thought that was a bit much, but uh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, sure. So that's one quick little module that we did for the main thing. Um, and that's good for me. I have a, a, another module. Let me just do one more thing here. Hold on. Split share screen. Uh, well, no, it wouldn't be appropriate for this one to show uh, the actual sign for the student. So I'm just going to stop recording here. So, 